Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Psych Podcast. We're super happy that you're joining us here on a Tuesday night, hoping that everybody is getting geared up for their uh, Thanksgiving breaks and maybe is done with work for a little while. But tonight we're going to, we're so excited for our guest, uh, Dr. Naguilari, and we're going to introduce him in a little bit. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about a couple different things. Um, he's broken his presentation into a couple segments. Um, so just start thinking about this um, for, you know, as you're formulating your questions. Um, but we're going to be talking about past theory and its relation to cast, the cast two. We're going to be talking about um, how valid is past theory um, as measured by the cast two. And then we're also going to be talking about PSW and SLD identification. So super excited to be kind of absorbing all of um, as much knowledge as we can from him tonight. But my name is Rachel and I'm a school psychologist right now working in the state of Maryland. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca and I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Connecticut. I want to remind everyone how to participate tonight. You can post your comments and questions on either of the two Facebook pages, School Psych, Your School Psychologist, or the School Psych podcast page, post in comments or in messages. I'll be looking for those notifications or on Twitter using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. And also right along the video on YouTube Live, um, comment right in there. I'll be looking for your questions and thoughts and ideas. And now I'm going to hand it off to Anna, who's going to talk about our poll. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm a school psychologist working in New York State. Um, we had a wonderful poll um, to get the conversation flowing about um, the PSW approach. So we asked you out there, does your district allow for a PSW approach for LD identification? And we asked you to check all that apply. Um, the top vote was 100 votes for, um, we allow for PSW, but a particular model or clear methodology are not specified. Second place at 67 votes was we require a particular model, discrepancy consistency model, concordance discordance model, XBAS, etc. Um, third place with 36 votes, we do not allow for PSW. Fourth place was 12 votes, I don't even know what PSW is. And fifth place um, with four votes is DEN's PSW model. So um, a lot of people are, are using this and it's um, really interesting and I'm so excited to nerd out. Um, so I want to introduce Dr. Jack Naglieri. Um, Jack Naglieri is a research professor at the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. He's co-authored more than 300 scholarly papers. Um, check out his website, jacknaglieri.com, and you can see, woo, he's done a lot of stuff. And um, he has helped develop numerous um, tests and rating scales, including the CEFI and the CAS2. So welcome, Dr. Naglieri. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Hannah. And I'd like to also extend my thanks to Rachel and Rebecca for um, helping make this happen today. And of course, NASS. And uh, I think back to John Kelly asked me if I would do this. And if, I can't say no to John. He's a friend <laughs> and uh, a great guy. So I'm happy to be here tonight. So I'm going to switch to my screen share now. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we remember from our NASP episode with Dr. Kelly, um, you kind of popped on and surprised us um, during oh, the convention. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was during the NASP convention. Yeah. I was just walking by, and John's like, hey, come here. <laughs> <laughs> and you were live. <laughs> <laughs> totally live. But anyway, so um, we have a lot to go through. First of all, um, you, you do have access to this uh, PowerPoint slideshow, which I actually put together tonight. I did find a, a, a typo or two here and there, but um, you can also go to my webpage to get other handouts, copies of my articles, read other hand, uh, handouts for other um, work that I do. You can also email me directly from that website if you uh, want to follow up on any questions. And I'm happy to hear from, from everybody. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear what uh, people are thinking about. So let's talk a little bit about what is this uh, theory I call past theory and how it's measured by the CAS2. Um, then we will look at its validity because um, it's very important to look and see how CAS relates to other instruments. So it's not going to be just validity of the CAS. It's really going to look at the validity of the CAS and the WISC and the WJ and the KBC. Um, so we're going to look at a lot of issues of validity, which really, I think, strengthen the argument of why CAS and this past theory um, is the best way to use a pattern of strengths and weaknesses for 
identification of children with specific learning disabilities. So that's that's where we're going. So let's start with the first topic. So, so past theory, planning, attention, simultaneous success. I'm not really going to explain them in, in a lot of detail, but I can tell you a little bit about more what they are. So this is a theory of brain function, if you want to call it that, or ability or intelligence um, that I've been working on for many years. And it's these neurocognitive processes that really are the foundation of learning. This is really a theory of, of learning, learning not just in school, but learning in life. And we make a very strict dis distinction between these abilities and skills. So even though people will often talk about reading ability or math ability, I don't think it's accurate to talk about skills as abilities. We have the ability to read, but that doesn't mean there's such a thing as reading ability, because actually reading is the outgrowth of all these cognitive processes. Now, we didn't just make up this theory. It didn't, uh, it didn't just come to us from looking at research that's been out for many years. Instead, it's, it came from us from looking at research about how the brain functions. And if you want to read about the neuropsychological underpinnings of PASS, I encourage you to go to my website and read this paper that I wrote with my friend and colleague, Julio Otero, um, the paper that outlines the neuropsychological background behind PASS, planning attention, simultaneous and successive. So here's um, my colleague, JP Das. We started working together um, in the 80s. This is what we looked like when we published the first edition of the CAS in 1997. And uh, this is what we looked like when we started. <laughs> like, it takes a long time to do this. And, uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to do to say, hey, I know how intelligence has been defined for the last 100 years, but we think we can do it better. Um, and that's really the that's really the underlying message. But uh, we'll see about that. So many years ago, when we first started working together, JP Das and I agreed that the, in order to improve our measurement of ability, we needed to rely on the brain, and that using factor analysis as a way of producing a theory of human intelligence didn't make sense to us. So um, in this test theory uh, book, there's a wonderful chapter by David Lohman where he argues that a research program dominated by factor analyses of test intercorrelations is incapable, a very strong word, of producing an explanatory theory of human intelligence. And of course, you know, that's what theories like CHC, for example, or even the WISC, which really is not a theory of human intelligence, but um, you know, a tool that's been developed and really leaning heavily on factor analysis. We, we didn't take it, that approach. Our approach was we know what the WISC measures. We don't want to be constrained by that. In order to be better than the WISC, we have to do more than the WISC. And one of the key issues that distinguishes cognitive assessment system from all the other tests is that we separate thinking from knowing. In other words, whenever you give a student a test, you should always ask, what does the student need to know to complete the task? And how do they have to think? So if you're giving a vocabulary test on the Wetzler, what do they have to know? They have to know the words. And the thinking is just retrieval of information. But what we want to measure is thinking, because that's the cognition. Because thinking underlies everything that we do, not just reading, not just math, not just learning how to ride a bike or drive a car or play a musical instrument, or interact in social contexts, or what it's like to be a successful adult. It's the thinking that we need to measure if we want to measure basic psychological processes. And that means 
when you reflect on all the different tools that we have to measure ability, they're so confounded by knowledge. So the CAS2 is not going to have information, similarities, arithmetic, comprehension, or even like on Woodcock's phonological tasks. Um, these are things that we acquire. These are knowledges, knowledge base, types of knowledge that we acquire. So we completely reject any kind of a subtest that demands knowledge. And why do we do that? Because we're trying to measure thinking, but actually, this is a topic that was discussed when the very first version of the Wexler was published. Remember the Army Alpha and the Army Beta? That's where Wexler got his ideas. And if you read Yoko Minyurki's book on the Army Mental Testing Program, which you can get on Google Books for free, there's a section there where they say, well, we have these verbal tests, which are information, similarities, arithmetic, comprehension, but we had these so-called nonverbal tests to avoid injustice by reason of unfamiliarity with English. So way back when, uh, almost a hundred years ago, it was clearly articulated by the people who developed the tools that we've been using since then, that if you really want to measure intelligence in a way that will be just across different groups, you have to not use content that requires what a person knows. And when you see the research I'm going to show you on race and ethnic differences, this is going to become really very apparent. So we measure pass, and it's really not complicated. It doesn't really have to be so complicated. Planning. This is a frontal lobe function. This is thinking about how you do what you decide to do. When you make a decision about how you're going to do something, am I going to use a strategy? Do I need more information? What? That's planning. Attention is very much like the name implies. Focus, cognitive activity activity and resistance to distraction. Simultaneous processing, you could think of like visual spatial, um, but it's actually more than just visual. It's about how we see things going together, like Gestalt psychology, when you remember you learned about Gestalt psychology. And successive processing is all about sequencing. So phonological tasks, speech articulation, tying your shoe, motor movements. So these four basic psychological processes correspond to different parts of the brain, and they're really neurocognitive abilities that are related to learning. Now, how can we measure this? Well, with the CAS2, I did something very different than I did the first time with the first edition of the CAS. We started off by essentially creating a second edition of the CAS2 with 12 subtests, but we added a four subtest CAS2 brief, which is really good for screening and for a quick assessment, 20 minutes. We also added a CAS2 rating scale, which allows the psychologist to get information about the behaviors the teacher observes in the classroom. And we're going to publish in February the CAS2 Spanish. So we have a 20 minute test in the CAS2 brief a 40-minute test, eight subtest version of the CAS2, a 60-minute test of the CAS2 in English or Spanish. I and really like, if, sorry if I could just sub, jump in, I really like the rating scale concept. Sometimes I've had kids that um, are not able to test for, you know, a number of reasons and um, having a rating scale would kind of help to supplement some of some of the things, and they're a little bit hard to come by, it seems. <laughs> so. Yeah, and of course, this is exactly based on PASS. Mm -hmm. So you're getting at the behaviors related to PASS that the teacher observes. And there's actually another advantage to the rating scale. It teaches the teachers about PASS. Mm -hmm. So when you do an evaluation of a student, and you have those PASS scores from testing the student directly, and you talk to the teacher about those scores, you can relate those back to what the teacher filled out with the pass rating scale. I like so that. It's a, it's a really a beautiful integration of all these uh, uh, concepts. So 
um, I'm a little bit behind, so I'm gonna, I wanna illustrate something because the one of the questions was, how is this different from what we have in other instruments? That was one of the questions. So this is a case of Alejandro, he's a real boy. Tulio Otero assessed him. He was having uh, reading problems and uh, academic problems um, in grade one. You know, typical kind of referral, but I wanna show you something. Here are his WISC and achievement scores. You look at these scores, and every time I've shown this, everyone says pretty much the same thing. Well, it looks like Alejandro's not too smart, not to be demeaning towards him, but to be descriptive, right? His, his scores on the WISC WIS vary from 70, you know, 75 to 86, and his achievement scores are similar. So we might say he's a really nice young boy, don't have too much high expectation, don't put too much pressure on him. But when you look at him with the cast, look what we find. He has a 96 in simultaneous and 102 in planning. Wow. Yeah, this is not the same boy that you would think of him on the WISC. Look at his attention score, 67. Mm -hmm and the 84 in successive processing. This boy has a lot of variability in basic psychological processes. He actually is learning disabled, has a specific learning disability. He's not intellectually de deficient, which is what we would be wondering about from the WISC-4 scores. Mm -hmm. So this case is not unique. We see lots and lots of these cases all the time where when you look at the cast, you see things you never saw before. Because the WISC, the Woodcock, the KVC, the differential ability scales, none of those tests get at basic psychological processes. They don't measure the ASS. And that's what you need to really understand these kids. So I am gonna skip that slide and pause here so that we can go on to the next section because I really want to talk about this. How does CAS really relate to other measures and how in terms of validity so that we can uh, stay on schedule? Yeah. So I have a question kind of related to um, what you've just been talking about. And I kind of share this question with one of our viewers who's typing in the chat here. Um, so it seems like it's kind of a step away from what, what uh, CHC would call um, your, your crystallized intelligence, your, your GC, um, which is interesting because some of the other PSW models that I'm familiar with rely pretty heavily on that and see that as kind of a major, um, an SLD identification from my understanding, um, a major thing that kind of you have to have that intact um, knowledge, but that it makes so much sense what you're saying about, you know, taking a step back from that kind of because, I mean, exposure, and I, I've worked with plenty of kids that maybe aren't exposed to the knowledge um, that we're then going and testing them on, if that makes That's sense. That's exactly right, Rachel. So how do you differentiate the student who has a disability from one who just hasn't had the opportunity to learn? You can't do it, but I'm gonna come back to that question next. Can I go on? Okay. All right. So I'm gonna talk about Race and ethnic differences, profiles, and correlations to achievement. These are really important issues for us in our field. As you know, in IDEA, we are, we are obligated to use non-discriminatory assessments. But how many people have really looked at the literature to see race and ethnic differences? You know, you won't find it in test manuals. I, I publish it, but a lot of people don't, and I think it'll be clear why they don't. You can go to my website and read this paper, 100 Years of Intelligence Testing, to look at the, the details of everything I'm going to show you next. In this book chapter, I summarized the differences between race and ethnic, uh, between race groups on all the different tests, the Stanford Binet, the WISP, the WJ, the KBC, and the CAS. And look what you find. Traditional IQ with all its achievement, 10 to 13 point differences between blacks and whites. And look at the KBC. When I published the second study here, we're at 6.1, that was my study published in a journal of school psych. 
I was the only person doing this research. People don't want to do it, especially people who have these tests for obvious reasons, right? But I don't. I always publish this stuff because it's my obligation to do this. It, it's, it's my obligation to share this information. And look we get. Caste clearly yields the smallest difference between race groups. Now, let's look a little further. Here's a paper that we did published in the journal, in the journal Intelligence with Hispanic and non-Hispanic children. We found the same, very small difference. But we didn't stop there. Here are two studies I did with Tulio Otero where we gave the cast in English and Spanish and we get virtually the same full-scale scores whether you fill it out in English or Spanish. Now, how is that possible? It wouldn't happen if you were given the WISC, but how is that possible? Because we're measuring thinking, not knowing. And it doesn't matter what language you think in. It, if the test questions don't require knowledge. Interestingly, even in our study with Italian uh, children, the cast is actually published in Italy. I call it the cast soprano edition, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but when, you, when you use the US norms to score the Italian kids, 809 Italian kids, you get the same mean of 100 because it measures thinking, not knowledge. But look at this. This was a paper published in School Psych Quarterly. If you look at the Woodcock Johnson, you know, there's your CHC. Look, as English skills go down, so too does, does the general um, intellectual ability score. That's not right. That means you're discriminating against people who don't have a good command of English, even if they only speak English. That's not right. By the way, there's a really great, uh, not great, and a really important um, court case that you guys need to read about, uh, a, a, a court case in Elgin, Illinois, where it had involved gifted children, um, where a district with 42% of Hispanics only had 2% in gifted because they were given the COGAT, which is just a group administered WISC. And so these Hispanic kids couldn't get into the gifted program because they weren't able to speak English and know English well enough. So the judge ruled that the district intentionally discriminated against Hispanic students. Mm -hmm. That has implications for what we do in school psychology with the WISC, with the Woodcock, and anything else that uses knowledge to measure ability. And now, just jump in too, I know California um, won't, I mean, I think the policy there, and if anybody's watching from California, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but is that they generally don't give intelligence tests to African Americans because of that difference that you were talking about. Right, and you know, the cognitive assessment system has been used, for example, in LA Unified School District since 1978. Sorry, not 78, 1998, a year after it was first published. Mm -hmm. And it's used a lot in California. So now, some people have said, well, maybe you get smaller race differences because you're not as valid. And I, I think that's kind of a silly straw man, but I'm going to show you how I tested that. I simply asked the question, how strongly does PASS correlate with achievement? And in this little complicated table right here, what I did is I went to the, the various test manuals and pulled out correlations to achievement and showed in every instance, the PASS scores correlate stronger with achievement than the WISC-5 correlates with the Wyatt, the WJ Cognitive correlates with the WJ Achievement, and the KBC correlates with achievement. So it's clearly, it's not like we're, we don't have as much validity. Now, another really important question is, I'm going to argue that you should use the profile on PASS to determine if a child has a pattern of strengths and weaknesses. But we need to know, well, is there evidence that there are profiles and do these profiles matter? So I've published two chap book chapters on this. Again, you can get these chapters on my website and read all the details. I'm going to summarize things for you. First of all, I don't look at subtest profile analysis because there's so much research by people like re really good 
people like Paul McDermott and Molly Watkins and Joe Cush and people that I've known for many years and have tremendous respect for who have said subtest profile analysis on the WISC simply does not work. And part of the problem with that, that we, I see we've compounded this, is by picking and choosing subtests from various tests and rolling them together. That doesn't really make it any better. So in my studies, I don't look at subtest profile analysis because I know it's not going to work. Instead, I look at scales that the various tests yield because they have better reliability and it should reflect whoever decided that's what the test is supposed to measure, right? Mm -hmm. So in the next slide, I'm going to actually show you three, two slides and then a summary that pulls them both together. This is a slide that comes directly from the test manuals. I went to the manuals and asked, what does the profile on the WISC-5, the WISC-4 look like for children with specific learning disability and reading decoding? And it's SLD, not LD, big difference. And if you look at these little graphs here, you can see, well, the WISC-5 and the WISC-4 basically the same. The only thing that's a little bit low is working memory, but still that's like in the upper 80s. Next, we look at the WJ. Well, it's a little low in long-term retrieval. That's just knowledge. But other than that, everything's at 90 or above. So that's not very helpful. So there's your CHC model. The KBC really surprised me. Everything's low. Well, look at the CAS. Students who have reading decoding failure have a deficit in successive processing. Well, that makes a lot of sense. The successive processing is about sequencing. And reading the codings all about sequencing, so is spelling, by the way. Now, this tells me that the CAS yields a certain kind of profile for these certain kind of kids. But oftentimes we struggle with how does an SLD person look different than an ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. So now let's look at the ADHD data. Well, in the WIS 4 and the WIS 5, you're not getting anything there. Everything's kind of, you know, 93 and above. The WJ, kind of a familiar looking pattern. With the KBC, everything's high, but look at the CAS. Now, remember, ADHD is a failure of self-control, according to Russ Barkley. It's a failure of impulse control. It's a frontal lobe executive function failure. So being low in planning validates that perspective on ADHD. We do have data that inattentive type of ADHD students are low in attention and not so low in planning. Now I'm going to put these two graphs together to show you something really important. If you look at these, look at the WJ profiles, they're virtually identical. So when you ask me about CHC, I say, well, first of all, if you think back about the correlations to achievement, those seven factors don't correlate with achievement any more than the KBC does with two, and certainly not more than the CAS does with four. So why do you need seven anyway? And the profiles are virtually identical. And the WISC, who knows what's going on with the WISC because no one knows what it measures anyway. You, know? you might want to read my, uh, my, my review of the WISC 5 that's published in Kaufman's uh, book that just came out. It's on my website. Um, and, but look at the different profiles for the CAS. They are dramatically different because these students are, from a cognitive processing perspective, dramatically different. They have a thinking disorder. They have a disorder in one or more the basic psychological processes. And this slide illustrates it. Now, there's other research out there by Bardos and others They've actually identified nine different core profiles on the CAS. JP DAS has shown profiles low in simultaneous, low in reading comprehension. So there's a lot more profiles out there than this. Mm -hmm. now, this is making me think too of had um, Dr. McGill on, and he yeah. talked about um, some of his research looking at. Um, assessments like the WISC um, and the WJ, and his research basically indicated that um, 
everything was so G saturated that you couldn't really tease apart validity wise all these different factors that they claim to be measuring. So um, that just, yeah, made me think of when you're showing a profile of an LD kid on the WISC and it's looking, or the WJ, and it's looking the same as an ADHD kid and it doesn't really differentiate that. That's reminding me of that, that episode that we did with him where he kind of explained that. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. If you look at Gary Canavay's uh, research, you know, Gary, I've known Gary for a long time and I also have a lot of respect for him. Um, he's not only studied that same question, um, do these subscales have enough specific variance to be interpreted? And he says, no for the WISC, no for the WJ, no for the Stanford Diné, but yes for the CAS. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. That's good for me, too, to know that you uh, know him, because I have emailed him and tried to get him on the podcast. So maybe now I can use you to <laughs> get him on as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, could, I, I could talk to him if you want me to. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so what we're looking at, traditional IQ tests have large race and ethnic differences. Um, profiles don't, you know, the past profiles differentiate and the past scores currently at the highest with achievement. So, you know, I think people often ask me, well, what should I do? I say, look, if you have to use the WISP because you have to use it, but use the CAS because you want to know why the student fails. And what will happen is when you use the two together, you're gonna, people are gonna start asking for the CAS results. And they're gonna say, well, we know what the WISC is gonna tell us, but tell us what the CAS tells us. And, and these data tell us it doesn't have to be so complicated. And I, I went to listen to Kevin McGrew last week when I was in New York School Psych, and I saw his diagram of like 60 abilities and all that stuff, and I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. PASS is more powerful Four can be more powerful than many if you have the right, the right concept, con constructs to measure. So what I'm trying to help you understand is really you should make a decision based upon the science, not on beliefs. And I think we do that too much in our field. There's too many people who are very convincing and, and write big books, but leave out the validity chapter. Yeah. And it's not about beliefs, it's about science. And why? Because it's not about what I say or anyone else says, it's about decisions you make for students and you change their lives. And that's really important. Sure. Oh. I, I think also when we get into the um, SLD portion of our discussion, um, some of my confusion around this are just state and federal definitions of SLD. Because, you know, don't some of those include um, more than just these psychological processes? Right? Okay, that's a really good question. Of course, I get that question all the time. Oh, this makes a lot of sense, but my form that I have to fill out says visual process or auditory or this or that, you know. And I say, look, the reality is every state has their own description of what kinds of basic psychological processes you need to identify. Um, they are made by committees. Usually they are built, built on concepts of the 70s, concepts that we know don't really work. Pick one, put a check in a box, but tell the teachers and everybody else what you really found. And sometimes you just got to kind of work the system, you know? And if there's a box that says other, just use the other box. You know? <laughs> so, you know, we have to work work our system. So let's go to the next segment, because I'm five minutes behind again. Sure. <laughs> so, so how do we use this? In 1999, actually in 1997 when I first did the CAS, but in, in my first edition of the CAS Essentials book, I outlined this discrepancy consistency method. And since then, there have been similar models been proposed in, in um, other books. And in my second edition of the Essentials, actually Essentials of CAS II assessment, which will be published um, by NASP, uh, by the time of NASP, uh, with Julio Otero, we again talk about this discrepancy consistency method. So I'm actually going to skip this slide and use, show you this one instead. So what does this mean? 
Remember when we had ability achievement discrepancy? We had an IQ score compared to achievement. We get a difference, we say, the kid's pretty smart, he can't read. We told the teacher everything the teacher knows. Hmm. But we never found out what was wrong. With the discrepancy consistency model, we get a difference between good cognitive processing and academic failure, but we get a discrepancy between good cognitive processing and a disorder in cognitive processing, and we also get a consistency between cognitive processing failure and academic failure. So at the base of the triangle answers the question, why the heck can't this kid read? That's the question you have to answer in order to help a student. If you're just guessing it, you're making some stuff up about some subtest profile analysis or whatever, you know, that's not going to help the teacher. But if you can say to the teacher simply, the child is really poor in success or processing, that's why they can't do reading decoding. That's why he can't tie his shoes. That's why he can't remember numbers in order. You've put it all together. I'm going to show you a case study to illustrate this. The way that we do this is we use the traditional of approach, calculate the child's mean, difference from the mean, determine if it's significant or not. The only thing that I do that's additional is I argue that to say a child has a disorder in one or more of basic psychological processes, that processing score has to be below the average. So the red line here is not evidence of a disorder in one or more basic psychological processes because it's a 95. Mm -hmm. So I have two rules. First, there has to be significant variability among the four scores. Using the Ipsit of approach tells you one is significantly different than the child's average, and the score has to be significantly below average. Now, the lower it is, the stronger you say SLD. The more evidence you have that the child hasn't, a good, hasn't been able to benefit with good instruction and all those other things, that's how you build your case. And you will be consistent with the IDEA and state regs. All the state regs have this definition of a disorder and one or more basic psychological processes. Well, when you go to due process hearing, you say, look, here's the definition. I measured it using the CAS. The CAS has all this validity evidence. So, you know, peace out. I did my work. <laughs> it works. So I don't, I don't worry at night. You know, I have confidence in what I found. I have a flow chart in the essentials book that kind of goes through all the steps. I'm going to skip that it's, um, given our time constraint. But um, I also will tell you in the forthcoming book, I have all the statistical analyses with determining if scores are significantly different or not and all that kind of jazz. So you're not just guessing at any of that stuff. Um, okay, now, here's the thing. Once you find out a student has a disorder in one or more basic psychological processes, you have a really important thing to do. And who is the most important person to talk to? It's not the teacher. It's not the parent. It's the student. Because you can bet that student has a bad self-image. You all work with kids all the time. And you know that that's the case. So in my Helping Children Learn book, I actually have handouts for parents and teachers and the students themselves. Sorry, I'm going to come back to that slide. Where we talk to the kids about what does it mean if you have a strength in planning? What does it mean if you're good in attention or bad in attention? And for simultaneous and successive. And what we want to get at is the child's mindset. And if you go on my website, you can download these two little measures of mindset that I put together with my colleague, Kathleen Kreza, to get at, does the child have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? It's an informal little rating scale, but you need to know this because you need to help the student have optimism for the future. And think about it. It's not hard to explain to a student what PASS means. Try explaining what fluid intelligence means to a 10-year-old. Seriously, or a parent for that matter. You know, these four abilities are not complicated. They're 
plain English. And that's what I really love about him. Now I'm going to show you another case. Um, I'm going to illustrate with Steve Pfeiffer's um, test, uh, the Pfeiffer assessment of reading. Um, I really, Steve and I are writing a lot of uh, papers together because I really like the way his reading and his math tests are consistent with PASS. In fact, um, in our in our in in my essentials book, Steve and I wrote the intervention chapter, and we align all of his measures with PASS. But I'll just show you a little bit of a <clears throat> one of the cases that Steve and I have in one of our book chapters. So here's your whisk. 89, 84, 82, 72, 76. You know, not very apparent, look bad in reading, but what do you say? Maybe you, you would, I don't know, say the child has trouble with working memory if you really think that would measures working memory. Um, but look at, when you look at the CAS, 92 in planning, 98 in attention, simultaneous 90, 72 successive, ouch. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And then look at this on Steve's test of phonological index, 75, but the other scores, not so bad. So what I really like about this is it really pulls things together very nicely. So here's how the triangle plays out. Planning in the top, attention, simultaneous, and comprehension, significantly different than successive processing on the CAS, but the phonological index, is not significantly different than the successive scale. And then on the left side, all of these are significantly higher than that. So if you have to use an ability achievement discrepancy, you could just look at the left side of the triangle, right? And say, yep, we met that. We're not using, you know, for the only doing that. That's fine. But the base of the triangle helps you understand what to do. And that's really the key. And we have in our in our um, publications these are the kind of uh, interventions that we would suggest and in my book these are the interventions that we would talk to the teacher about and the parents about and we would give these strategies to the kid now i am gonna skip this next example with reading comprehension because i wanted to get to the to the other question that was asked about um, intervention. And um, so in our field, I'm the only person with intervention research. I published my first paper in 1995. In that study, and again, you can read these studies, in that study, we found that when you have children who are poor in planning on my test, if you teach them, actually, if you encourage them to be more strategic, they improve in their academic performance on classroom math. In the second study, we found the same thing. When you help students realize the value of being strategic, that's not direct teaching, it's not direct instruction, it's like encouraging children to reflect on what they did and what they could do better. Children who were low in planning improve considerably more than children who are high in planning. Said another way, cognition, predicted, response to intervention. Mm -hmm. I rep so that's the second replication. Replicated the third time, Deanne Johnson, school psychologist in California, we published this article in the journal Learning Disabilities, which is a hard journal you published in. We found the same thing. Using traditional baseline intervention, students who are poor in planning, improved dramatically more than children who weren't poor in planning on math activities taken directly from their curriculum. Planning predicted response to intervention. The most recent study, a randomized control study, published in a journal learning disability, Jackie Eisman, Dr. Eisman, this is her dissertation. In this study, we had a traditional experimental control group, and we found that these kids actually, our control group, got more math instruction. But teaching children to think about how they did math was more effective than more math instruction. And we saw that 
when we used math fluency, standardized achievement tests, and why at numerical operations the, the experimental group was still better. A year later, we went back and the experimental group was still better. And when we looked at the students by profiles, the kids who were lowest in planning improved the most. Cognition, in this case, planning predicted response to intervention. So when, and we also have a similar study with reading comprehension, again, planning predicted response to intervention, the lower the planning kids, the more the improvement. So clearly in the research that I've done, all these studies done by myself and other people, cognition matters. If you have the right measure of cognition, if you use the WISC, does it work? We don't have any studies on the WJ or we don't have any studies on any of the other tests. But I've done this research because it was important to be able to demonstrate that cognition does matter. And that's what this does. And I'm two minutes over time. Sorry, ladies. No, you're doing good. <laughs> we're, we're, we're engaged here. Okay. And I know we have a couple questions um, from viewers, so we're going to try and get to them. And I also, um, um, so we had Dr. Burns on before, and I'm not going to derail us. And um, <laughs> obviously, you don't have enough time um, to go into everything. But he advocated for um, skill-based intervention. So if there's a deficit in reading, you teach reading. Um, so you would advocate then, if there's a deficit in one of your psychological processes, that you're, you are seeing good effect sizes, that you should intervene there? Or are you still saying intervene on the skill? Are, you, are we intervening on the processy or, or the academic subject? OK, let's think about this for a second. If it's just a matter of teaching the kid reading, that's already been done and hasn't worked. So what are you going to do, switch programs and see if that works, right? Um, becomes kind of shooting in the dark. But look, if you have a child who's low in success or processing and they're getting a wholly phonics program and you know, you now you understand that the problem with the student is that the child can't work in order and the teacher is teaching in a way that demands working in order, then you can help the teacher understand why that hasn't been successful. Mm -hmm. And it's this mismatch of the student to the instructional program that's really at the core of how to do better teaching. It's, you know, students aren't like rats in a maze. They think, they have feelings, and they have different levels of abilities across these four dimensions. And these four dimensions interact with the instructional methods. And that's what Steve Pfeiffer and I have been spending so much time writing about is you have to understand the processing demand of the intervention and the extent to which that matches or doesn't match the characteristics of the student. And when you give the student what they need, like in the planning facilitation research I've done, the students who are low in planning are disorganized, they don't know what to do first, you know, they, they have no use of strategies. When you get them to be more thoughtful about how what they do what they do, you see the improvement. So what I disagree with, with Matt Burns and others, uh, more by more my behavioral colleagues, because you know the behaviorist doesn't believe in the mind. And I don't, I don't disagree that behavioral models have value, but they're not sufficient. They're yeah. not sufficient for understanding a student. If you really want to understand success and failure, you have to understand brain function. And you can ignore it all you want, but look, we've been ignoring it for a long time, and it's time to stop ignoring it. We got a, a few great comments online. Thank you to the viewers out there who are watching live. We got um, Linda M, who says, uh, shout out to Dr. Naglieri. Um, Jennifer would love to stay late to keep talking about this, and uh, is curious about how many districts are I'm using the 85 versus 90 cutoff for defining weaknesses. Um, and um, Eric, of course, also has an awesome comment. Um, cu he's curious about how you concept conceptualize SLD and LD. Okay, let me respond to a couple of those. First, hi, Linda M. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and the difference between SLD and LD is a really important distinction. You know, the definition is a specific learning disability. It's not learning disability in general. 
my my friend Ken Cavalli, who unfortunately died some years ago, used to really emphasize this, and he was so right. You know, if you're talking about LD, it's a mishmash of who knows what, but we need to be very specific, and that's what we're looking at with PISS. We're looking at specific learning stability, and you can have a specific learning stability with a specific cognitive weakness and a specific academic weakness. And that's what we need to detect as good evaluators. We have to um, detect those differences. Um, what was the other thing? I think there was one more thing that you mentioned. Oh, do you know if people use 85 versus 90 as a cutoff, just in your experience? Okay. That's a really good question. Look, there's no magic number. I, I, I think it has to be below 90. Now, I think the lower, the stronger. You know, is an 89 sufficient? You know, not not really. Um, is an 85 okay? 16th percentile. You know, where do you draw the line? You know, it's it's not a decision that I or anybody can make. It's a decision that you have to make on a personal basis, given the the full picture and any evidence, other evidence that you have. Um, but you know, I, I I would just again a emphasize. The lower the score, the stronger you make your stance. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Naglieri, for joining us tonight. And this has been extremely interesting and educational and a lot more information than I think a lot of us got in grad school on this topic. And <laughs> if you wanna write another poll about how many people out there are using the CAST tube, it sounds like an awesome instrument that I haven't yet had to experience with, but it sounds very great. Um, final, final thoughts or comments, ladies? Uh, I'll say that I really like um, what you had to say about kind of the ELL population and how that's less influenced um, on your measure just because um, one of my schools has a very high ELL population and that's something that we struggle with and we do a bilingual screening and we try to figure out, you know, what the language dominance is. And at the end of the day, I, I often feel like I'm scratching my head. Like, did I really get a good measure? Is this really what's going on? So um, I'd like to hear I just want to tell you one more thing that I think is very important. Um, as far as ELL assessment is concerned, I mean, I showed you the data and that's so very powerful. And now with the Spanish edition of the CAS, that's going to help greatly. But here's the thing, when you administer the CAS, it's a very different administration format than a traditional IQ test or all the other tests for that matter because after you've given the instructions in, in the standardized manner, there's a place where you pause and you essentially ask the student, do you understand? And if the student doesn't, you're allowed to explain what the task is to the student in any way you want. You're not, not teaching the student how to do the task, you're explaining what the demands of the task are. And like when Tulio is in, is working with a bilingual student, he'll switch to Spanish and, and talk in Spanish to the student. Um, and if he's not using the you know the cast two in Spanish, and and if the child's deaf, you can you can sign. If the if you're working with an interpreter, that's where you would help the interpreter explain to the student as needed. And this is a, a freedom that we haven't had in these standardized tests. And the thing is, it really works. We've been doing it like this since the test was first published, and we know it doesn't hurt its reliability at all, but actually improves it on its validity. Wow. I, I wonder if, in, during the RTI process, if you were to administer a CAS early and then create the interventions based on it, would you find a reduction in SLD qualification in your building? Well, um, the CAS 2 rating scale can certainly be used in a tier one or tier two environment. That's really its intent. Mm -hmm. I would caution, however, that the validity of any method should not be determined by the extent to which students do not get services. Right. Right? The, the validity of any method should be determined on the basis of the extent to which the students thrive after whatever we do was completed. Right? It's very, very important. Now, and of course, you know, legally, you can't deny or, or delay 
a comprehensive evaluation because you do an RTI. So um, I would urge if, you, if you're going to work with the teachers in a tier one environment, definitely use the CATS2 grading scale. It actually can be used by teachers and I train a lot of teachers and teachers can buy it and use it on their own if they want. Um, but I think when you use it as a psychologist, when the teacher first says, hey, I'm wondering about this student, it's pretty easy to do that. And that would be your first step. Very helpful. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, um, we're, we're out of time. So um, thank you again, Dr. Naglieri, for joining us. And our next episode is December 4th. We're going to have a SPED lawyer on. We are so excited. So mm -hmm. tune in, everyone out there, to check it out and learn more about the legal implications of what we do and how we do it. Um, and thank you again. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. And um, if you need anything, just go to my webpage and send me a message. <laughs> okay. Take Thank care. You. Good night, everyone. Good night.